Well, thanks very much for having me here and especially to the school teachers who've, after teaching all day, uh, coming in here and, and f for this is, um, shows great commitment to the subject and so thank you very much for that. Um, I must uh, confess I am not an applied mathematician, I am in fact a pure mathematician so uh, I'll have to be, be, um, keep that in mind in the things that I'm going to say to you today. So we've been hearing all day through the various talks about the importance of the applications of mathematics and that's, I want to talk to you today just about one little application of mathematics to the real world. And in fact, one of the, if I ask you what's the most common question your students ask you, I'm sure you'll all say, what use is this on every topic? And it's really important, I think, it, it's a very important question for students to ask that. And it's a fair enough question for them to ask as well. And it's, so it's very important for school teachers, I think, to have an answer to almost every piece of mathematics that, that you are teaching. And even though, as I say, I'm a pure mathematician, whenever I teach any piece of mathematics, I try and make sure I'm aware of at least one application of it. Don't have to go into great detail about, all the, about how it works or uh, all the, the technical side, but you should be able to give one answer. So when a student says to you, why are we learning trigonometry, for example? Well, you ought to be able to give an answer, and so I'm going to talk to you very briefly today about um, from waves to signals and a little bit on the, the power of trigonometric functions. So th this is probably the only talk today that actually involves some mathematics, so uh, th this will remind you of some, I hope, interesting mathematics from uh, when you are at university. So basic questions, how on earth do you hear what I'm saying? How does your mobile phone receive and send messages? How do the forces of an earthquake propagate? Oh, which one do I do here? Sorry, Chris. Ah, oh, there it is. And of course the answer is by waves. Well, what is a wave? I'm not going to attempt to give you a formal definition of a wave, but the more important question is how do we use waves or how can we model a wave using mathematics? And the answer is of course using our trig functions. And so when students ask you why are we learning our, our trigonometry, why are we learning about trig functions, you should immediately pull out your mobile phone and wave it at them and say this is one of the reasons why you're learning your trig functions because without trig functions engineers can't design, can't develop, can't improve your mobile phone technology. So just a simple example, when you're teaching graphically adding curves together adding trig functions together, well one just does it and d does the mathematics but making the connection with waves is really important. So whenever I teach trig functions, even if it's in an elementary course, I always use this word waves all the time to get into their head that what I'm doing is I'm playing with wave motion. So there's a particular example and there's what you get. So when you add a wave to a wave, well you get a wave and often a more complicated way than the one you started with. Well, not all periodic functions are trig functions. In fact, many signals that occur in real life are not trig functions at all. They're in fact things like square waves, sawtooth waves and so on. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to describe how to, I'm going to pick one particular wave and it's a wave that looks like this. There's a wave. And I'm going to show you how we can analyse that wave, very simple looking wave you might think, how to analyse this wave using trig functions. Because after all the trig functions are continuous but this one, this particular wave is not. You might like to think about what scenarios would arise where you'd, you'd have some kind of wave like this or some physical process that led to some kind of graph like this. For example, you might think of the pressure in a car piston which slowly builds up and then is released and builds up and is released. So curves like this, although they're, they're 
strange looking curves for us, they're actually curves that that turn up in real life applications and we want to be able to analyse them in some way. So I'm just going to do a simple example to show you how to analyse this curve. And the way we're going to do it is I'm going to use infinite sums of waves. I'm going to begin with a simple um, but important example using some integrals. So we're going to work out the integral from minus pi to pi of sine 4x, sine 7x. Nothing particularly sacred about 4 and 7, but we're going to work out what this integral is. Well, I'm going to use the product to sum formula, which you may or may not recall. You can quickly derive it and check. And I can rewrite this integral as a difference of two cosines. So you take the cosine of the difference of the two minus the cosine of the sum of the two, and you get a half out the front. And now that integral is easy to work out. And the answer, of course, when you do the math on it, is zero. Now, just enjoy that integral for a moment because, you see, I said there's nothing sacred about the four and the seven. The important thing is that they are... They're different. They're different. Four and seven are different. So when you multiply um, sine of... Uh, two signs together with a different multiple of x there, then you can use a similar technique, use the, this um, product to some formula, and you get zero every time, which is a rather interesting result. And it's a very important result as we're going to see because, um, well, let me firstly come to what happens when they're the same. So I'm going to do sine 4x times sine 4x, same integral from minus pi to pi. Do the same thing, use some double angle formulae. And this time the answer is not zero. You get pi coming out. Okay, well, there are a couple of funny integrals, but what actual use are they going to be? Well, before I show you that, I'm just going to summarise what, what those um, things imply. If we've got uh, sine mx times sine nx, where m and n are different, the answer is always zero. And if it's the same, then we end up with pi. Same thing happens for cos, exactly the same result for cos. And for any m's and n's, when you integrate cos times sine, you always get zero. Okay, why are these so useful? Why are these so important? Well, I'm going to take our, our function along here. I'm going to take the function y equals x. And for the moment, I'm going to just restrict it between minus pi to pi. And I'm going to try and build that function. I'm going to try and describe this, this particular wave here by using trig functions. Well, how many trig functions? Well, I'm going to be very greedy, and I'm going to use infinitely many trig functions in this. That is, I'm going to try and write... By the way, this function is an odd function x, y equals x is an odd function, so it makes sense to try and approximate it by odd functions, so I'm going to use the signs. Okay, so I'm going to try and write x, it's a rather strange looking equation when you first look at it, I'm going to try and write x as an infinite combination of uh, sine x, sine 2x and so on. So I'm going to write it as bn sine nx. Well, who are these b's? I'm going to try and get my hands on what the coefficients look like. So, well, we start modestly, so I'm going to start off with B1 and see if we can get our hands on B1. And I'm going to multiply both sides. There's my, uh, what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to build X as a combination of sine X's and so on. I'm going to multiply both sides of that by sine X and I'm going to integrate from minus pi to pi. And now think about what we saw in the earlier slide. When you multiply two signs that are different, and integrate, everything vanishes. You get zero. And that wipes out almost all of the infinite series gets wiped out except for the very first term. And we saw before that one comes out to be pi. So I can rewrite then this, um, this b1 as 1 over pi times the integral x sine x. Now how do we work out that? Integration by parts, very good. Integration by parts. So, um, by the way, you can use exactly the same argument to get a formula for the general term, the nth term, you're going to get that integral, and now we're going to work out the integral in general, and we're going to do it by parts. 
So you may perhaps have been teaching parts recently, otherwise you might have to go and perhaps revise your integration by parts, but there it is. And I just do the calculations, I won't go through it in detail, but you do the calculations on it and you end up with minus 2 on n cos n pi. Now if you start plugging some numbers into cos n pi, you see it alternates, it goes plus 1, minus 1, plus 1, minus 1. And so you get bn is minus 2 on n when n is even, and 2 on n when n is odd. It's always nice in mathematics when you're doing something complicated and something simple comes out. And I hope you agree those coefficients are pretty simple. They're just minus, plus or minus 2 over the n, and th these are the coefficients, remember, that we were trying to find to build this function x. So I'm going to plug that back in, and there it is. Now, just in, do enjoy that equation. That is an amazing equation that raises all sorts of questions I know about convergence and, and so on. But uh, it is well known that as long as I'm in the interval minus pi to pi, then that infinite series, and it's an infinite series on the right, does in fact converge everywhere back to the function on the left. It's a very um, amazing equation that you can, you can take x which is a polynomial, and you can write it as an infinite linear combination of the trig functions. You can build x from the trig functions. Well, that's all very heavy maths and all very interesting, but what's happening graphically? Can we get a picture of what this is actually doing? So all I'm going to do is I'm going to take the first couple of terms and plot them. This is something we couldn't do when, when I was a student at university and first saw this. We couldn't do this. We had to use our imaginations. And I never really quite believed this, these equations when I was a student. But <laughs> until you actually see it graphically, then it really starts to come home, I think. That's what happens when I take the first five terms. Now, just look between minus pi to pi. Remember what we're trying to do? We're trying to approximate, we're trying to describe these waves here. And taking five terms of this, that's what it looks like. It's not a bad job, even with five terms. Well, let's be a bit more brave, and I went on to 20 terms. And look at that. Now, in between, you see we're getting lots of wobblings, Lots of wobblings happening in between. Have a look at what happens at the endpoints as well. The, the graph takes a great leap up into the air to get down to the other side. And then it's got to get itself back up again. That's a very important uh, thing called the Gibbs phenomenon that happens with these things. Well, let me do a little bit more. I went to 100, and you can barely see the wobbles now. And you can see how... These in this, this series of trig functions is used to approximate what's happening there. Well, I'm a pure mathematician, so I can't resist uh, just doing one more little bit, and that is I'm going to, well, firstly observe that it becomes periodic. I'm going to put x equals pi on 2 in, because pi on 2 is in the region, and you s plug it in, you do some calculations, and out comes this rather lovely formula. Pi on 4 is 1 minus a third plus a fifth, and so on, minus a seventh, and so on. A remarkable formula. You take the odd numbers, take their reciprocals, change every second sign, add them all up, and you get uh, pi on 4 in the limit. Lovely fact. So, the next time your students ask you, why are we doing trigonometry? And when you're teaching trigonometry, please use the word waves. Wave your mobile phone at them. Tell them and make sure they understand that when they're doing their trig, trig is the basis of wave motion. And that's the basis of our, our modern uh, telecommunications technology. Thank you very much. Questions for Peter? They can be mathematical or non-mathematical. <laughs> yeah. It's just a little question, because I, I don't know, but could you use, could the calculator use that series then to approximate pi? You know, you're not... 
That's a very good, good question. Um, can, the, can the calculator use that across the phone? The answer is yes, but very slowly. That series, there are much better ways of an other infinite series that converge much more quickly. This one, it does converge to pi on 4, but it takes a long time. You'll take a lot of terms before you get reasonable accuracy. But that, that, that's a very good question. Oh, how does it do it? Well, it does use infinite series. It, it, that's how the calculator does it, only it takes a finite, um, it chops it off at a certain point and uses polynomial series rather than trig series to work out logs and exponentials and so on. Time for one last question. Yes, up the back, hang on. Just wait. That just tap into what the lady was saying and what you were saying about the technology. That may also even answer and Chris um, later on the presentation that what kind of a technology or software would you use to demonstrate such, but in a way that is attracting the attention of the juniors we're talking about might not be the senior because senior might already know those, but so that can build their interest and then probably that goes on to, you know, we are building their further interest into mathematics in the future. Yeah, that's a very good question and in, it is always difficult in the juniors because the kids haven't got enough machinery to be able to, to do interesting things with them. But you can still draw the pictures. You, you haven't got to do, assume the junior kids can do integrals, integration by parts, but you, if, once they've done the graph of the trig function, yeah, you can show them, the, without deriving it, you can show them the Fourier series and you, you can get the computer to draw pictures and get them to see how the two are connected. And I think most kids would get slightly excited about that when, if they can see how the signals can be connected back with what they've been doing on trig functions, on drafts of waves. And also, even in the junior school, when you're first teaching the graphs of the sine functions, talk about waves, not just here is the graph of the sine function. Link it back into wave motion, because that's what it really is all about. And I get students who turn up at university, who've done all the calculus and so on, they've never made the connection that the sine curve is a wave, and it's connected with wave technology. Let's thank Peter once again, everyone.